Welcome to the debut edition of Sound Off Inbox here on the official Solo Monster Sounds of YouTube channel. This is the pilot episode. I am the Solo Monster, in case you couldn't figure. I don't know why I just did that, but I am the Solo Monster. This has been a long time in the making. I think I said to you guys over the last few weeks that I was planning on migrating the mailbag from the main podcast over to YouTube. And that does not mean I will not do any more mailbag questions on the main shows on, on Sundays. But to get to more of your questions, because there's so many I don't have time to get to, I figure why not start a new feature here on the YouTube channel? And why not go on camera? So we're trying new things here. That's why I'm calling it a pilot. So I want feedback from you. I want to know what you guys think of this. Uh, if you want to see more of these. And I want more questions from you as well. And so you can keep emailing me, thesolomonster at gmail.com. You see the email address on your screen right now. You can also submit questions this way. Leave your question down below in the comments section. So you have two different ways to send questions to me. Email or just leave one question down below in the comments section. And I'll try to get to your question. We'll do more of these videos uh, going forward. So that is the way that you can submit questions. Please always include your name and where you are from and try to keep it brief because as you can see, real estate is light here on the screen. So the shorter, the better. Try to condense your question into as few words as possible while still trying to get your point across. Okay, with that being said, let's get right into it. We have the first question on screen right now from Brianna in Jackson, Mississippi. Isn't that like a Bruno Mars song? Jackson, Mississippi. Anyway, I'm very white. I saw Kevin Castle tweet that all three members... And by the way, shout out to Kevin Castle. Uh, all three members of The Shield have flopped as the top babyface champion in WWE. And I cannot seem to argue this point. Dean's run with the title did not deliver past the first Shield triple threat. Roman was severely miscast as a babyface what else is new? And it is, is it safe to say that Seth's time as a babyface champion has officially been a flop? That is from Brianna. And I think it's a really good point. I don't know that Dean got as much time with the title. I mean, he definitely didn't get as much time with it as the other two. So it's kind of hard to judge. Didn't really set records as the champion. Roman, Roman's one of their biggest stars, but... Did he really succeed as the champion? Did he get over as that heroic top babyface that the company wanted him to be? No. And they tried multiple times with him. And believe me, they're going to try again. And then there's Seth Rollins. And, you know, a lot of people are dumping on Seth lately. He's not had a good few weeks. Seth Rollins as the universal champion? Would you consider him to be a success? I wouldn't. I, I, at the end of the day, it, it depends on how you define success. Is Seth Rollins a huge hit at the box office? Not that I've seen. Ratings continue to go down. Arenas are still half empty. And the way that he's been booked and portrayed on television? He's actually one of the worst book champions they've had in many years. So I can't say that any of the three S.H.I.E.L.D. members have had a whole lot of success as the champion. Roman, I guess, by default would, would have had the most success. But just because they put him in a whole bunch of WrestleMania main events, does that really make him a success? I still feel like they're trying with him, and how many years has it been? So I think it's a good point. This question comes from George in Manchester. I don't know if we're talking Manchester, UK. If there's a city of Manchester. Manchester United, maybe he's on the team, I don't know. Do you think Chris Jericho is the best pro wrestling champion at the moment? I think he is better than Kofi, Brock, Rollins, and Adam Cole. Thoughts? Well, again, I think it's just such a subjective thing. Like, what, what do you consider to make a great world champion here in 2019? What, what would your criteria be? I mean, isn't that the question that should be asked? To me... I want a world champion who is a star, who people want to pay to see, who carries himself like a star, who looks like a star, who can go in the ring, all, you know, all those things, who can talk. So when I look at the champions we have right now, I think Chris Jericho is a great choice for the first AEW champion. I said that 
months ago when they were promoting Jericho and Adam Page. I said, it's too soon. Too soon for Hangman. You got to go with Jericho. And it was the right choice to make. Now, Jericho's having an incredible run right now. Is Jericho killing it at the box office? Maybe not, not necessarily, but I think he's a great representative for them to be the champion. I think that he, he can certainly talk better than most. Is he the best champion at the moment? Well, I mean, let's look. Seth Rollins, flop. Brock Lesnar, he just got the belt back. We don't even know how much he'll be on television. Kofi, look, I went on a whole rant about Kofi last week. <clears throat> and the thing with Kofi is, they protected him a lot more than I ever thought they would. At the end of the day, did it make a difference, him holding that championship? Did it result in some kind of boom for SmackDown or boom for WWE? I mean, I know he had the boom drop, but no, there, there, there was nothing like that. And he was still, you know, coming down to the ring, doing the whole New Day act. He was beating people. He was beating a lot of people. Kevin Owens, Daniel Bryan, Sami Zayn, AJ Styles, uh, Randy Orton. He's not the champion now, so we'll put him on the side. Adam Cole... I think Adam Cole is a good choice for NXT champion, but NXT is still, it's not positioned with Raw and SmackDown. I mean, it, it's just not sort of positioned at that level. And we don't get to see uh, too many Adam Cole title defenses. The thing about Adam Cole's matches when he's in there, he's having some of the best matches of the year. So I think Adam Cole has to be in the conversation. Don't forget about Okada in New Japan. Would you not consider him to be a great world champion? You want to start talking about matches and tickets and, and what he's meant to business? I would argue, I think you can make the argument that Okada in New Japan, of all the current crop of world champions in wrestling right now, even though we haven't heard too much about him lately, you look at Okada's run, all the reigns he's had over the last five plus years, he may be the most important champion. He may be the champion who's done the most business, or at least meant the most to his company out of all of them. Nick Aldis, I think, carries himself very well as the NWA champion. So, what does that mean? You know, is that the most important thing to you? Because Nick Aldis looks like, he looks great. He comes out, he looks like a world champ. Dressed to the nines in his suit. It's a subjective thing. If I had to pick one person right now, if, you know what, if it's not Jericho, honestly, I'm going to go with Okada. That would be my choice. My, my choice. I can't even talk. Let's go to the next question. This one is Ivan in the Bronx, fellow New Yorker. It's hot as hell in here. You know, we're heading into the colder weather. And the landlady turned the heat up, so I'm boiling in here. Not that you care. Would The Undertaker be the major star he is today? Had Hulk Hogan defeated him at Survivor Series in 1991? Likewise, would Stone Cold Steve Austin be the major star he is today had HBK beat him at WrestleMania 14? It's a good question. I do think The Undertaker would have been fine. I think people love the gimmick. Just, you know, it's just the right time. I mean, when is there a right time for an undead zombie character, I guess? It worked more back then than it would today. And by the way, and I'm going to talk about this in a different question here, I do think The Undertaker character, played by the right person, could work today also. But I think people just became enamored by the Undertaker character. And he never sold. I mean, there had never been anybody like that in the company before. He would take everybody's big moves. He would do the zombie sit-up. I mean, that's the coolest thing in the world. Had he lost to Hogan on that one pay-per-view, I think he would have been fine. Austin is an interesting case. You know, we talk a lot now about WWE booking decisions. Look at what the Vince McMahon just did with The Fiend. And Seth Rollins at Hell in a Cell. People saying, oh, The Fiend is dead. The Fiend is buried. I don't believe that. I don't buy that. I think The Fiend, he'll be okay. I have faith. I shouldn't, but I do. But the minute somebody has one really horrible loss, boom. I mean, that could be it for them. And I don't know if it's just the fans lose interest, the company loses interest. Austin losing at WrestleMania, everything was built to that moment. Everything was built for Austin to, to take the, the flag and run with it. And had they screwed the pooch and gone the other way and Sean didn't want to lay down and Vince said, well, you know, Shawn Michaels, he doesn't want to lay down. We'll go with Shawn. If they didn't pull the trigger at WrestleMania on Austin, I don't know. I don't know that the fans would not have given up on him. 
Austin was that good that I think he probably would have been okay, but I'm less sure of him being okay than I am of The Undertaker being okay. I think Undertaker would have gone on to have the run that he had. Austin, probably, but I don't know, would have been harder. Because when you miss your moment, when you miss your moment, you're not always able to get that back. All it takes is one bad booking decision to kill a career. That would have been a bad booking decision. So I'm a little less sure about that one. Flint, buy or sell on Matt Hardy or Chris Jericho as the person who had the best time wrestling-wise, including character, buzz, etc., after leaving WWE on the indies or in another company? Hmm. It's a good question. Matt Hardy had a career renaissance. When he left Impact, or when he left WWE, he went to Impact. Remember, first it was, uh, was it Money Matt? Is that what it was? Money Matt Hardy? He was walking around with dollar bills, and, and he was very entertaining in that role. Then came the broken stuff. He was losing. He was down on his luck. From that, the broken character was born, and this guy created an entire universe. <laughs> entire universe of characters... Himself, he brought his wife, his kid, his wife's, uh, you know, his, his father-in-law, his brother. It's this whole universe of characters that he created, House of Hardy and the Halloween stuff. I mean, very innovative, very creative. And I think one of the big success stories as far as people leaving WWE and going to work somewhere else. But then you look at Chris Jericho. Chris Jericho right now is the world champion in this new upstart promotion that has all the buzz in the world. And six months from now, who knows if AEW will have the same kind of buzz and juice behind it that it does today as I am recording this in October of 2019. Who knows? But he's their world champion. He's the centerpiece of the promotion right now. He went from WWE to making apparently the best money he's ever made, according to him. Even more so, even more than what he made in WWE. Signing for the most money he's ever made. He's their world champion. He's the leader of a new faction. He's on television every week. He's on TNT. You know, major cable station. You go back before that. Jericho in New Japan. Totally different version of Chris Jericho. He's, he's trying to do his bruiser, best Bruiser Brody imitation. He's going around. He's throwing weapons around. He's painting his face like a clown. But he had some big matches in New Japan. That Wrestle Kingdom show last year was promoted in large part around the whole Kenny Omega Chris Jericho match. And he's had some other big matches since then. He's probably going to face Tanahashi at the Tokyo Dome in January. So you look at the body of work that Chris Jericho has put together, even outside of WWE. I can't sell on that. I have to buy on Jericho and sell on Matt Hardy. Yeah, I look at the stuff with Matt in Impact and you wonder. Big Fish Little Pond? I mean, is that really what it is? I love the broken stuff. But you look at Jericho's body of work, how can you vote against that? He's had success everywhere he has gone. I have to buy on that. Brandon, in Odessa, Texas, which characters from the 80s and 90s do you think would and would not fit in with today's era of wrestling? So... What I wanted to do with this question, I wanted to expand it out beyond the 80s. Because I, I was able to kind of jot down some 80s characters. But I really wanted to open it up to like the early 90s too. Just because there's more options if you open it up to the early 90s. So that that's what I'm doing here. And there's a pair of gimmicks I, I wanted to also include in this. Because I think, I think they could still work. If they came on the scene today in 2019 with the right promotion... Uh, and the right, and when I say promotion, I don't mean just the right company. I mean promotion, promoting the, the gimmicks the right way, pushing them the right way. I think even today they could work. Uh, the thing is, you know, in today's generation, you've got social media, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. You've got hashtags. You've got things trending. Things go viral. Everything is is memed. Everything becomes a meme now. So when I think of that, the first two gimmicks that come to mind are Papa Shango. I mean, you can mock and scoff Papa Shango all you want to. There's a lot of people out there who think Papa Shango is a stupid gimmick. 
okay, you know, he's supposed to be some voodoo master. I get it. Do I think Papa Shango would be popular today if he debuted? Oh, you bet your ass he would. Are you kidding me? I think Papa Shango could get over big time in 2019. Now, would it work uh, in, in terms of people looking at it and going, oh, it's a stereotype African witch doctor? Yeah, I don't think people look at Papa Shango as being a racist gimmick the way they look at a lot of other gimmicks from the 80s as being racist, stereotypical gimmicks. I think they look at Papa Shango and say, oh, it's just silly. He makes people ooze black shit from their head, and he puts a hex, and he made Ultimate Warrior throw up pea soup. Do I think that would be a, a popular thing today, him putting curses on people? He should put a curse on whoever uh, put together that press conference to announce the uh, the Crown Jewel show earlier. <laughs> Did you see that? I'll get into that on Sunday. But I think Papa Shango could work today. The other gimmick and the reason I wanted to expand it out to the 90s that I absolutely think could work today, but there's only one person who can make it work. And unfortunately, he's dead. So it's not possible. Is Matt Bourne portraying the original version, the heel version of Doink the Clown. Doink is a very underrated, underappreciated gimmick. Even when I was younger, I probably thought it was stupid. I, he wasn't one of my favorites. I just probably didn't care. I probably looked at it and thought the same thing a lot of people thought. It's a stupid clown. It's a guy in clown makeup and green hair and big shoes. But he played that character perfectly. And with the heel music and him playing pranks on kids and giving them a balloon and popping it. Oh, my God. If you don't think that would get over today, you're out of your mind. And he's the only guy who can make it work. Unfortunately, he's not here. Uh, and I don't think that they should try to resurrect it with anybody else. Uh, and to be honest, the way WWE books things, they'd probably fuck it up somehow. But I think Papa Shango and Doink absolutely could work here in 2019. Gimmicks that absolutely would not work. I put together a little list of a few other ones so I don't forget. I'm going to start with the biggest name that there is. Hulk Hogan, the real American hero. People aren't into the whole real American hero thing today. If Hulk Hogan came out as the real American hero, draped in the red, white, and blue, talking about America and, you know, the evil foreigners and everything else, he would be booed out of the building. Now, maybe Hogan could make it work because he was very charismatic. He could cut a promo. I'll take a Hulk Hogan promo over a Seth Rollins promo any day of the week. Coked up Hulk Hogan? Coked up Macho Man? Sure. Give me some more of that. So maybe he could make it work. But this notion of Lex Luger, the real American, Hulk Hogan, the real American, it would die a death if they tried that today. It just wouldn't work. So I threw Hogan on my list. Kamala. The African uh, or the, the Ugandan uh, giant, Kamala. Now we're getting into the whole racial, stereotypical gimmicks. This savage who doesn't speak from the deepest, darkest Africa with, with a moon painted on his belly, smacking his belly. Yeah, I don't think that would work today in 2019. The Million Dollar Man. I think that would work. But again, the right person would have to play it. We had his son... Almost as like the new age million dollar man with Maurice. And that went, <clears throat> that didn't work. You need somebody like DiBiase who knows how to play that character. But that could absolutely work. Virgil, his uh, black man slave. Yeah, that would not work in 2019. <laughs> that would not, no, no. That would be a very bad idea. Akeem the African Dream. I will say I have a soft spot for Akeem. He made me laugh when he would come out. He made the most of a stupid gimmick. It was stupid. It was very, very stupid. He literally had Africa on his back. This fat white guy comes out in blue and yellow with, with the headgear, dancing. I don't know if it was the best possible way or the worst possible way. I'm not a great dancer, so he may have been a better dancer than me. He comes out looking like a fool, but to that Jive Soul Bro music... I love that music. It was entertaining to me. I could see where other people would be offended by it. And it absolutely, positively, would not work here in 2019.
That that probably would be at the top of the list of gimmicks that would not work. That and Saba Simba would not work in 2019 for all the reasons that you would expect. A lot more awareness, sensitivity. Look, if social media existed back in the 80s and Akeem came out, or Saba Simba, imagine Twitter back then. <laughs> imagine people protesting the company back then. They did a lot of race, racist shit back then. This is not a matter of, oh, you're being overly sent. No, it was racist, stupid shit that they got away with. I remember Slickster sitting there eating fried chicken out of a bucket, you know, as he threw it to his uh, music video for Jive Soul Bro. Stuff like that wouldn't work today. Undertaker. I mentioned him a little while ago. I think Undertaker would work, but I think Mark Calloway would have to, he would have to portray the character. Some guys just know how to play it. You can't just put anybody. Look, they had a fake Undertaker. Didn't go very well. Glenn Jacobs, he's the only one who could have made Kane work the way that it worked. They put one or two other people in the costume. It was never going to work. So Kane's another one. Would work today. 20 years later? Yeah, it would work. Absolutely. Absolutely. Tatanka, there's another one of those gimmicks. Now, I know he had a comeback in 2005. It was brief, but he did come back in 05. But even even the world, I mean, look at the way the world has changed from 2005 to 2019. Forget 1985. And Tatanka going around with, with the Indian headdress, you know, going like this and, and doing all, I mean, it just wouldn't fly. It wouldn't fly today. Now, the one I wanted to bring up here at the end and I'll throw this to you guys. You can comment. You can chime in in the comment section. Is Goldust, the original Goldust character from 1996, if that character came on the scene today, how would people react? Would the company get so much blowback to that character from Glad and, and organizations like that that they would just have to abandon it the way they abandoned Muhammad Hassan? Yeah, the, the, literally, the network went to them and said, this character has to go. And it wasn't his fault. He was doing what he was told. He did a good enough job with the gimmick. But it just wasn't politically correct. Gold dust coming on the scene, rubbing up on guys in the ring, you know, all the, the sexual overtones to the character. Do you think that original gimmick would work today? In, in WWE or in any company, would that character work? I don't think it would work for very long. I really don't. You know, the gold dust we saw in 2002, hamming it up with Booker T, very different than the original gold dust. Gold dust coming back in 2013 and teaming with Cody and facing the Shield, he was gold dust in name only. I'm talking the original character, 95 to 97, 98. I don't think it would work. Probably not. I'm guessing that it wouldn't. Frank, in Atlanta, GA, we know WWE's Celebrity Hall of Fame wing is a ploy to get free press for the event. If there is one person who has a legitimate reason to be there, Arsenio Hall. You know, I think they're doing a second Coming to America movie. I think Eddie Murphy is working on a sequel. I wonder if Arsenio is in it. He was in the original. I like that movie. I just wanted to throw that in there for no reason. He never got proper credit for legitimizing pro wrestling in the mainstream media. Uh, in the early 90s, he was one of only a few talk shows who would have wrestlers on his show. He never uh, or he never treated them as phonies. Should WWE consider him for the Hall of Fame? Yeah, I, I have no problem with them considering someone like Arsenio. Arsenio treated them with respect. He had a lot of WWF guys on his show. He had Hogan and Warrior and Savage and DiBiase and Virgil and Akeem. Um... I'm sure he had a whole bunch of others on there, too. Piper, maybe. Then there was that little bit of controversy with Hogan, where he thought Hogan was coming on to admit that he had taken steroids. And then Hogan swerved Arsenio and his producers when he came out at the last second. He didn't quite own up in the way they thought he would. I don't know if he had wrestlers on after that. That might have been the end. I, I know he and his people were not happy about that. They felt very much uh, blindsided and betrayed by Hogan. Uh, and WWE. 
So Arsenio uh, played an instrumental role in getting more mainstream attention for the company. If you're going to put Arsenio Hall on the celebrity wing, I, I have to float this name because he's another guy who was a big wrestling fan who has always been very respectful to wrestlers. He had a lot of WWF guys on his show, even up to the Attitude Era. Uh, and that was Regis Philbin. Kathy Lee, I could, you know, I have no use for her. But Regis was always a big wrestling fan. Probably still is, I'm guessing. I mean, I don't know if he watches. How could he? I mean, there's so much of it now. Who in their right mind over the age of 80 would want to waste their final days watching Raw? I mean, come on. But back then he had Undertaker on his show. He had Yokozuna on his show with Mr. Fuji, which was comical. Ultimate Warrior. Uh, I remember he had Stone Cold, probably in 98. And I think he would he would play around with them and he would like, in, in a funny way, kind of come at them. And I remember there was one episode where Austin, I think he hit Regis in the chin by accident. <laughs> I don't, He didn't knock him out or anything, but, uh, you know, he would have fun with it. He was a WrestleMania 7. He made a cameo there. So if you're going to put Arsenio in the Hall of Fame, I think you also got to show some love for Regis because he was a big fan who gave them a lot of press also. Kirill in Moscow, Russia. Got a lot of Russia stuff in the news. And now we have a question from Russia. In Russia, question owns you. I want your opinion on Diesel's recognition as a top star in WWE. I think one of the biggest issues was that the majority of his accomplishments took place on a non, on non-televised events. He won his first IC title, tag team title, and WWE title on house shows. From the viewer's standpoint, I think it's crucial to the success of uh, the character. If these title victories had been shown on TV, do you think Diesel would have had more popularity as a top guy? I don't think one has to do with the other. And by the way, he won the Intercontinental Championship on TV. I don't know where you got that he won it at a house show. Unless there's some mystery reign I'm not aware of. He beat Razor Ramon for it at a Superstars taping. So that's not accurate. But yeah, his first tag team title was uh, on a house show against the Head Shrinkers, right? With Sean. Uh, his first world title was on a house show, but they showed it. On, it's not like they didn't show it on TV. It was eight seconds long. It was one second longer than it took Kofi Kingston to lose the championship to Brock Lesnar. And they aired it on television. We all saw the footage. Didn't really do much. You were either a Diesel fan or you were. And I, I don't... I mean, I understand the point you're making. That those moments are are big. Because they get replayed. And if it's in the main event of a WrestleMania, you have all the fireworks and the pomp and circumstance. And it's a big moment. I don't think it affected his popularity one way or the other. You know, Kevin Nash was a very charismatic guy. He was big. Big guy. But he just never caught on. He had charisma in a, in a way that was very different from guys like Hogan and Savage, who were more outgoing. Um, and I, he probably was just put in the role too soon. I mean, he was in the company... How long was he in the company before they put the belt on him? A year? year and a half? He wasn't ready. He made the most of it, but he wasn't ready. Lee from Barnsley, England. I have a theory why WWE keeps pushing wrestlers and then cutting their legs out from under them if they push a wrestler hard and the crowd gets behind them in a very big way hollywood comes calling so they only allow them to get to a certain level and then rein them in to bring them down a few notches what do you think i've said that on my show many times before i don't think we're ever going to have a a breakout star like a steve austin or a rock or even a john cena at that level ever again and john cena is the latest example he never shows up why because he's in hollywood He's making Transformers movies, and now he's part of the Fast and Furious franchise. So WWE sees John Cena being lost to Hollywood, just like Rock was lost to Hollywood. So I do think that they don't want anybody to be bigger than the company. The brand and the company is the absolute biggest thing in the world, and they do not want you to be bigger than that. I don't think we're ever going to see a star in that company on that level ever again, because you're right. I don't think, I think they probably are afraid. You know, if they happen to find that one big star, the last thing they want to do is lose him to Hollywood. So uh, I think that we are likely never going to see anybody at that level ever again. I think you're right. Uh, Michael from Montesano, Washington. Who do you think Brock Lesnar will lose the WWE Championship to? I think it will be Rey Mysterio. I think you are wrong. 
Come on, open your eyes. It's Roman Reigns. Of course, I say this now. The draft is tonight. Now watch Roman get drafted to Raw. <laughs> this will already be outdated. But look, if he stays on SmackDown, and we're going to find out in about an hour, uh, then I... Th look, it's clear as day that they're taking their time. They're going to build to Roman Reigns once again, challenging for the championship. If Brock has that belt, guess what we're getting at WrestleMania next year? We're getting Brock Lesnar and Roman Reigns again. What is the worst pay-per-view you have ever attended live? Steve from Virginia. Huh. Worst pay-per-view I ever attended live? Which WrestleMania? Let's see. WrestleMania 32? <laughs> WrestleMania 32 may have been the worst WrestleMania that I've attended. Uh, I've been to every Mania since 28. That probably was either the worst or the most disappointing. Worst pay-per-view? I would say probably Fatal 4-Way. Remember that one time they had a Fatal 4-Way pay-per-view at the Nassau Coliseum? Yeah, I was at that show. I don't know why, but I bought a ticket and I went to that show, and that show was no good. And guess what? We never got another Fatal 4-Way show again. I can't imagine why. And finally, we'll end with this. Ryan from Ackworth, Georgia. Do you think we could see a working relationship between AEW and the NWA? Um, we could. I mean, look, AEW can partner with whoever they want to. I don't know why the NWA wouldn't want to form alliances with other promotions. It only helps them. Gets their name out there. Now, I saw that first episode of, of you know, NWA Power this week. And I'm going to talk more about it on Sunday's show. I thought it was great. Now, it's just one episode, but I thought it was fantastic. It was a great mix of matches and promos. It wasn't just nonstop match after match after match. Which, frankly, I think AEW and NXT both have, have fallen victim to these first couple of weeks. At least we got the Jericho promo on AEW, which was very good. But a lot of it is just match, 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 match. We need promos. We need guys who can cut promos. Well, guess what? Eddie Kingston, he can cut a hell of a promo. Nick Aldis isn't too bad either. So I, I have, after one week, become a big fan of the NWA and, and want to see where they can take it, where, where they can go from here. Um, if they could form some kind of an alliance with the uh, AEW promotion, I think, and have a few of those guys come by the studio the way uh, guys would back in the 80s. They would go from one territory to another. You look at Ric Flair. When Ric Flair was the NWA champion, he would make appearances in Memphis. He would stop all over the place. You know? He can wrestle. He would wrestle Jerry Lawler in studio, and, and Lawler wouldn't beat him, but he would come close. He would go around the horn and he would help put over other guys in other territories. Uh, maybe you can work out something similar where guys come in and, and have a big match here and there. Uh, so yeah, I think anything is possible. I think AEW needs to first form something with New Japan. It just, there's no reason for it not to happen. Could they form something with the NWA? It depends if they think they could get something out of it. Does AEW have to? Do they need to partner with the NWA? They don't have to. I think there's more in it for the NWA partnering with them, maybe getting some of their talent on TNT uh, and not just YouTube. So I hope I hope they can work it out. I hope all these promotions work together, even if WWE isn't willing to. You know, one way AEW can differentiate itself from WWE is by being more open to these kinds of partnerships with other companies and having some of that talent on their TV show. I think right now they're they're doing things the right way. Focus on your own talent get your own talent over uh, but over time it just freshens your own show up when you have new faces that stop by you know somebody comes by with a championship belt over his shoulder from another company oh you've piqued my interest you know he comes out and cuts a promo on the AEW champion oh where's this going WWE is never going to do that uh, but these other companies can differentiate themselves by working together so yeah I'd like I'd like to see something like that absolutely so we'll end there this was fun. I just want to be able to get to more questions since there's so many I get. I read everything you guys send me. I just don't always have time to respond or, or get to it on the show. So we'll have a few questions on the main show here and there. But I'd like to turn this into, if not a weekly feature, maybe every other week. You know. But let me, let me know what you think. Again, this was a pilot. This is the first episode. This was a, a test. Uh, do you want to see more of these inboxes here on YouTube? And uh, we will do at least... You know, we'll, we're going to do more of these, but for the next one, 
You can email your question to me. You see it on your screen there, the solomonster at gmail.com. You can also leave your question down below. There we go. Uh, down below in the comments section, uh, one question per person, please. Uh, you can leave a question that way if it's easier. Uh, and I will pull from those questions for the next edition of the inbox. So that's how you can submit questions. Uh, and that's it. I'm out of here. That's all I got. I am the Solomonster. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Please give this video a thumbs up. If you did enjoy it, I have to find where this camera is. I am all over the place. Uh, give this video a thumbs up, and I will see you back here again with more of your questions and answers very soon. Until next time, take care, guys.